do a quick contrast for you. We have Corsica, France, and we have the Appalachian Mountains. Okay? Now, now Corsica, France is very, it's kind of mountainous. It's very forested. It's a Mediterranean climate. They get about 14 inches of rain a year. And in the Appalachian Mountains, we have, you know, lots of, lots of tr deciduous trees. So it's also forested, and it gets about the same amount of rain. And the contrast here that this gentleman observed, and I'm going to tell you about, was profound. So he looked at Corsica, and he said, in Corsica, they had chestnut orchards. In, a in Appalachia, they grew corn. Okay, and I'm not putting down Appalachia. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and put down Appalachia. I'm just doing a contrast. In Corsica, they made roads that went in and out of the mountains like this, on the horizontal, or what we know as the contour. In Appalachia, they went straight up. Come on in. They went straight up and down, you know, most, most direct route. In Corsica, they grazed goats and sheep underneath, this, underneath these trees, and in the Appalachia, they, you know, had pens and everything and brought feed to the animals. And so we have this, this major contrast between these two, two um, ways of doing agriculture, okay? And, and that's one of the things that I, I want to I talk about today and how it relates to, to water, all right? So we have these, these diametrically opposed uh, uh, methods. And, and I'm here to tell you, and I'm not going to tell you when this book was written, so I'm going to have you guys guess here in a minute, that it was amazing that, that this idea, and I'll give you a hint, it was a long time ago, that they, they approached this in this manner. What he called very simply two-story agriculture. Amazing. Amazing concept. You know, we, we talk about uh, you know, edible forest gardens and food forests and that kind of thing. And so we, we know the layers and everything else. But very simply, a long time ago, they said two-story agriculture, which was <coughs> his whole premise was to stop soil erosion. He, he saw that as a number one problem. Okay, And by the way, Jeff Lawton also today sees that as the number one problem. Okay, Soil erosion, topsoil erosion. All right, so... So he had this idea that we needed we stop we need to stop tilling on the especially on the slopes and on the hills where gullies are made. Man, you are awesome. That is great. All right, cool. I was just going. I was just going to keep going, and you got it hooked up for us. That's awesome. Thank you. So this this whole this whole thing of two story agriculture, and how he what he said was he said that. This type of agriculture sustained generations of people and animals indefinitely. Okay, does that that's not ring? I mean, this this is a, an amazing thought. Okay, and, and there was footnotes in this old literature that go back and say like that some of these chestnut orchards were dated back to the times of the Romans. They were they were producing chestnuts for a thousand years. Amazing. Okay, absolutely amazing when we look at soil erosion, okay, and then we get to this point about water because it's, they're totally interconnected, okay? So we're going to talk about water today. I'm going to give you some principles and, and some methods along the way, okay? So, it, But it's not going to be like, okay, here's how you build a swale, here's how you build a pond, that kind of thing. But it's more like principles. How do you apply this? How can we think differently about this subject, okay? I'm here with my lovely wife, Monica, and uh, we're from North Idaho. We have what we call the prepared homestead, and we also have a homestead and breakfast. So it's a it's a and b on a permaculture demonstration site. It really, it's what it is. Okay? And we're bringing people in, and they're going, whoa, what is this? What's different about this? And and we show them. So part of our part of the stay is we do these tours. We give people tours. And, and that, and they're just like, wow, this is amazing. Because don't we have a problem today where we look at, uh, you know, it's like, this, this whole myth, like if we're going to feed the world, we got to do commercial ag, right? That's the, that's the big myth. And, and part of, there's so many ways to break that down and, and, and throw that out the window. It's not even funny. But one of the ways is that when they measure and they look at land use, they, they look at land and they say, well, oh, arable land, we need to only count arable land that fits into the commercial agricultural model. Okay? We're growing on slow, non quote unquote arable land. We're growing a ton of food, okay, on non-arable land. So it, we can blow that out of the water. 
Okay. So, uh, you know, one of the things, I have these two quotes for you, and I promise I'm not going to read to you a lot. You guys, come on in. You're just going to have to get comfortable. Just, just we do. We have to be comfortable. Like, yes. Be annoying and you can be uncomfortable <laughs> okay, or I'll, annoying. I'll be annoying and okay. uncomfortable. Here we go. <laughs> I and, right and so here. let's look at let's look at a couple quotes. And again, <laughs> this, there's not going to be a whole lot of quotes. I'm awesome. here. No, I'm fine. I'm okay. This one, this first one, and again, this is from the book Tree Crops, and I really recommend you guys read this book. You need to get this book. It's called Tree Crops. Crops. And now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get, it's called Tree Crops, a Permanent Agriculture. Tree Crops. <laughs> a Permanent Agriculture. Amazing, isn't that? Yeah. Who can hear, who, yes, when was it written? Any guesses? Huh? In the 30s. 20s and 30s. Very, yes. Early, or uh, mid to late 20s. Copyright is 1929. And, and just look at it, look at these quotes. He says, on steep eroded land that rainfall, on steep eroded land, the rainfall penetrated six inches with water pockets, with water pockets, four feet, okay, four feet of, of soil infiltration with the simple concept of a water pocket. Okay, so you know, in, our, in our, our sophisticated society, we don't use this kind of terminology. We, you know, we, we say things like design for the site and we have swales and key line design and, and you know, soil infiltration techniques and all this, but back then, they had this, we were not the first ones to figure this out, is what I'm getting at. Okay, people before us have known and figured this out. This guy was in the 1920s saying, we've got a soil erosion problem. I mean, think about that for a minute. We've got a significant soil erosion problem. We've got people that are plowing and tilling on sloped land. And that's about the worst thing you can do, is creating gullies and eroding topsoil at a, at a rapid rate. And we're still doing the same thing today. Okay? <clears throat> Now, let's check this out. This is even better. He says, every furrow along the road planted on the absolute contour held water, whereas it drained away from the others because they sloped a little. In a few years, Mr. Lee observed that the trees of the contour row, which had the water lying above the trees, at every rain were distinctly the largest in the orchard. Okay? So we know this as, you know, swaling. Uh, we know this as um, planting on, on the downhill side of the swale. Is everybody familiar with swells? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Okay. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about swells. And um, but, but this guy had it figured out in the 1920s. Can I ask who the guy's name is? Lee. Yes. yes. His his name is Russell Smith, Russell and he wrote Tree Crops: A Permanent Agriculture. So you must read. A must read. Okay. It's a uh, just you know it's way past um, whatever that's called copywriting and all that. So there's PDFs online. Okay. So you can grab that PDF online. Uh, and, and read that book, and it talks about it. It's just, it's mind-blowing. You know, it, what is the, what are the vast majority of crops in the United States grown for? Animals. 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 N and namely, you know, corn yeah. and soybeans. <laughs> okay? This guy was like, acorns, chestnuts, apple, mulberry. I mean, he's like, well, why are we not doing this? This is lots of pockets in the world, and including in the United States. People have done this for generations. Yeah. And, and what, remember what I, what I said? Indefinitely sustained generations of people and animals. Amazing. To totally amazing. Okay? So very good. Anybody know this guy? Never left? No? Is that Wendell Berry? Yes. Excellent. Okay, Wendell Berry, great writer, uh, wrote amazing... Uh, he, he's got uh, his just his simple work on defining modern life is is wonderful. It, you should read that as well. Um, he, I mean, his his basically he kind of rails against commercial agriculture and say, hey, you know, that's not sustainable in the long run. And I don't mean sustainable in the the term that's thrown around a lot, where uh, in most cases when the when the word sustainable is used today, it actually doesn't mean sustainable. <laughs> okay. What I'm talking about is that 1929 definition mark where Russell Smith said indefinitely sustained generations of people in house. Okay, that is sustainable. Okay, he said men are free precisely to the extent that they are equal to their own needs. We need to be making and, and fulfilling and providing some of our own needs. We don't have to do everything ourselves, but we need to be doing something. <laughs> the other thing that Wendell Berry talks about a lot, and I think this should resonate well with us, 
is uh, he says the disease of modern character is specialization. Okay, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with specializing in certain areas, but especially like as permaculturists, we need to be generalists. Okay, we can have a couple of areas of specialization, but we should be generalists. Okay, and so you have to know something about uh, soil fertility and uh, different plants and how to integrate plants and maybe maybe animal husbandry or, and pollinators and um, soil uh, health and uh, water holding capacities and strategies. You know, we have to be generalists. We can't be an expert at every little thing. And he he says the disease of modern life is specialization. Okay? We're all specialized. We all outsource we outsource our eating to agriculturalists, right? Commercial egg, namely, mostly. We outsource our health to doctors, right? And hygiene specialists, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we need to start looking at internally and first, just like the prime directive, anybody know the prime directive of Molson? Anybody? Work makes work. Well, that's a good one, but no, it's prime directive. Let's take responsibility for yourself and that of your children. Prime directive. Before the principles, before the ethics, all of that. That's what he said. Okay? All right, so let's look. And, and by the way, I recommend The Unsettling of America, another recommended read. Okay, so just a quick, quick touch on us. Okay, uh, like I said, we have a 40-acre homestead. We manage uh, 35 acres in forest land. Okay, in a good silvicultural prescription. Okay, and uh, we work about five acres, quote unquote, intensively, and in, in a zone, zone sector permaculture designed um, uh, demonstration and education site. Okay, that's what we do. All right, so we've got um, uh, we've got you know, seasonal where we use the uh, dry composting toilets and solar showers, and in Cthulhu, what I'm going to talk about today is a. Um, hot com or compost hot water so we, we've done some experimentation with compost hot water and we'll talk about that today we've built ponds and we've swelled and tried to increase soil fertility and soil infiltration so we'll talk about some of that today as well uh, but we're not without our our, um, our issues okay we you know we need to build resilient properties so we've had forest fires start within a half mile of our property We've had, not on our property, but on our access road, flooding, okay, this last spring, massive amounts of water. Now we're super dry, okay? So we need to, we need to moderate the impacts of drought and flood, and we can do that through walk, you know, implementing water strategies. Some of our animals, we, we rate, we're a, a full kind of polycultural homestead. So goats, sheep, uh, pigs, rabbits, chickens, ducks, turkeys, okay, all of that. Um, we have perennial annual gardens, and you'll see there, I don't know if you can see it, it says poultry and rabbit yard. All of our gardens are, are also uh, poultry yards and or rabbit yards. We manage the disturbance level in those areas based on, on um, the garden. Okay, well, I'll show you here in just a second. We have a kind of a wild, more natural food forest where turkeys range through there probably six months out of the year. But Monica has a, a, a very you know, zone one medicinal and culinary herb garden where um, the only poultry that goes in there are if they're, you know, in rehabilitation. We're trying to, to uh, one's injured or something like that. We're trying to kind of run them through. Okay, so managing that disturbance level with the animals in our gardens. A culinary medicinal garden, again, poultry yard, but very little disturbance. Same with food forest. So, um, and this is a, just a, a partial list of everything we've got in there. It's fairly young in establishment, but we're getting some good production from it, right? A good permaculture principle is get a yield, right? So we're getting a yield. We're starting to get a good yield from this to include animals. Okay, so we run animals through there as well. So that, that whole idea, that concept of the two-story agriculture. Okay, we, again, we have, that's what Russell Smith called it in the 1920s. We have a fancy term for it. Today, and it's a subsection of agroforestry, which is called silvopasture. Anybody ever heard of this? Okay, good. A few. All right. So we're doing the same thing. We have the same ideas, but none of it from the 20s until now is very widespread. But I think that really we need to go to this agroforestry slash permaculture model more and more, and we, we can make some great strides if we do that. 
Um, you know, we raise and process all of our own meat. Okay. Um, we have livestock guarding dogs. You guys remember the cartoon? Ralph and Sam, right? That's that's bear. He is. I mean, look at him. That's he is. That's him. Especially as it, the sun starts to go down, and he's sitting there, and he's like just looking. And he'll hit on birds of prey and coyotes and things and just kind of keeps everything kind of pushed away from the property. He's so a can... Great Pyrenees? He's a Great Pyrenees Akbash mix. Oh, beautiful. Yes. And he Wonderful stays dog. home? He yeah. stays home, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he <laughs> wanders a little bit, but not much. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, you're, yes, a typical livestock guardian dog may wander quite a bit. He doesn't do so that much. Okay, so, of course, as a permaculturist, as, as we are, the vast majority of, of our, <coughs> our system is perennial, but we do have annuals as well, so we grow squash and tomatoes and peppers and all those kinds of things as well. But by far, the main effort is perennial. Okay? All right, so let's talk about, let's get into this framework of talking about water. All right, because um, um, th this is crucial. So I, I like to use this as a framework. Has anybody ever seen some of these principles before? Of course, you know, observe, we know, know that one. Uh, slow spread and soak probably sounds familiar to a lot of people here. Uh, maximizing uh, living ground cover. Okay, so, so I'm sure a lot of these are, are familiar, uh, but if we look at, at our systems through this framework, we'll start changing how we think. We will, we'll start going, okay, how do I observe? What does that mean? You know, we know. Okay, we want to observe uh, our our land, and you know, to determine best land use. If we're going to design for the site, we need to to observe and be be familiar with with the property. Okay. Same thing with water. I'm constantly out out in the rain, watching the flows and everything else, and I know now where where the water breaks from one side to the other, where it pools where it dries out the fastest, where it maintains its moisture. So we have to understand that microclimate. All right? so, so these are some principles that almost like as a framework to look through when we set up water strategies. Okay, so observe, start at the highest point possible. Start small and simple. Slow spread and soak. Plan for the overflow and manage that as a resource. Maximize living ground cover and continually reassess. So can you guys see this picture okay down here? We'll do a, we're going to do a quick um, test. What do you guys see, and what can you know from that? What can you observe, and what, what types of things like pop out at you when looking at this picture? So this is a, this is a learning workshop. You, you're going to... You're gonna it kind of looks like it's at the top of the hill. Uh, maybe that's just the... Uh, and and that's, that's a good, good observation. It's terraced, so I'll just give you that. Oh, okay. It's terraced, mm -hmm. yes. It, it just seems like um, that would be the natural course of how wildlife would be going across the hill because they would be traveling that and so it's collecting the water in those, uh, you know, terracing things. Okay. It seems like, like that's how, when you see the mountains and all the wildlife has been going like that for such a long time, they terrace in those little rivers. Okay, so almost like deer trails. That deer trails, and, yeah. A terrace. That's a good point. This, this is a, a kind of a man-made terrace system. I've actually had, it's a, it's a third of an acre, it's, it's our food forest. It's a, what we call our zone two food forest. Okay, so I've got all those listings are, are in there. Chestnut and hazelnut, apple pear, et cetera, et cetera, comfrey, loads of, of stuff. Okay, what else can you observe from that? Is it like a southeast aspect? You're, get, you're hitting, you're getting, you're going down the right path. You're going down the right, no, this is not, like facing this way, but you're going down the right path. Well, the snow's laying down in the, what looks to be the lowest part. Okay. It probably has no sun for the aspect reason. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Okay. Again, we're starting to observe. We're starting to pay closer attention. Okay. So, so let me let me get break it down for you. And I, you know, yes, I have the the uh, advantage of living on the property and I'm seeing it every year. Okay. Um, so this, we're, what we're doing is you, the camera is looking west. Okay, it's looking west. Okay, so our, our house is here. This is that, now it says this is zone one, medicinal, an herb garden. And then just outside of that is kind of that zone two terrorist food forest. We're on slope, so we need to, to take measures like that to, to, to increase water infiltration. Okay, so it's terrorist. However, 
And of course, as you can see, it's surrounded by deciduous, I mean, I see this, con coniferous forest, okay? Uh, with a little bit of birds and things in there. All right? So if you notice, you've got a lot more snow accumulated on the left side, okay? On the south side, now, now, this will make sense in a minute, and less on the north side. Okay, now if you were to look and see where all the trees sat and the oak, where the opening was, then what you would see is like, okay, the sun path that moves across and, and sets in the west over here hits this in a particular way. And what it does is it makes a microclimate. Okay, so in the areas where you see there's no snow, you know that's, that's getting more sun, right? It's, it's melting off first. It's, it's a little bit faster. So it's a little bit warmer. The soil warms up a little bit faster on, on the right side as you're looking at, as opposed to the left side. So it's sunnier on the right. It's shadier on the left. It's a little bit more moist on the left. Okay, so one of the, one of the main things that we can pull away is we need to design for the site. Okay, we need to take advantage of, of our, our property. If there's low areas, if there's moister areas, we need to match, match cultivars and varieties of plants to that. Okay? Is anybody here like a, a well versed in fruit trees at all? Any fruit tree enthusiasts or you just like them? And of course everybody likes fruit trees. Okay, so if you look at you know pear, apple, and um, let's see, peach. Pear, apple, and peach. Okay, so those those three as an example can handle wet feet versus dry feet, some more than others. Okay, so pears can handle a little bit more wet feet, apples are somewhere in the middle. Peaches don't like wet feet at all. They actually like a little bit drier areas. You know, they need moisture, but they need to, they can handle a little bit drier areas. So with that in mind, where do you think I planted pear versus apple versus peach? Yeah, so as we move to the drier areas, peach trees. As we have more on, on the left side of the, of the screen, we have more pear. Because okay, again, they can handle some moisture over there. We get a lot of moisture in there in the spring. Okay, and then apples kind of all over, but more so in the middle. Okay, so we get a design for the site. So when we look at water, the first thing is, it's not so much how do I get more of it, it's like where is it coming on my property to start, and, and where is it, you know, very dry. All right, so that's, that's one and very important point I want to make. All right, so if we look at here, so we have the, the, that's that same area, just inside taking a picture down one of the um, terraces. Okay, so there's that flat terrace, flat, and then it's sloped up there. Um, so out of these over here, what do you think I want to point out with this picture? Starting at the highest point. We yeah we can say that because uh, you know we want to we want to try, try and slow spread so of course, but but when you look at this, what do you see? Living ground cover. Living ground cover. Okay, maximize living ground cover. So it's just this big, you know, people come over and they're like, well, they're amazed, but they're like, it looks so untidy. Yeah. So it is untidy. <laughs> it's designed to be that way. Um, so we usually preface, especially when I have, and I love garden groups, when we have garden groups come take tours, we say, okay, first thing you're going to notice, it's not going to be this neat and tidy gardens, but there's a reason for that. And then we go to explain it, and then by the time they're, they're done, they're like, this is really cool. Okay, I can, maybe I can at least... And start bringing in some pollinator tractors and beneficial insect tractors and things like that into my garden. Okay. All right. So yes, maximizing living ground cover. We don't. I, I. I'm not. If I had a big giant pile of mulch, I'd use it. Okay. But if I don't have that, I'm going to maximize living ground cover. Okay. So mulch will provide some of the same same uh, functions: moisture retention. Increase soil fertility. Um, how about this? Moderating soil temperature. Mm -hmm. Hugely important. Hugely important. I, I unfortunately I, I took a picture this morning, but I didn't get it in here. Is um, right now it's very dry in our place. Okay, real dry. And we've got these tall, you know, tall grasses. Some of them are eight feet tall, and some of them are just you know this tall. But they're all, you know, dormant. They're not dead. They're dormant because it's dry. And hot, but and then a lot of them are laying over, over the ground. Some of them are still up, but they're you know they look brown and they look dead. They're not. Yeah. They will come back. But they're that's moderating the soil temperature down below. That's that's helping to retain moisture. And so we do provide a little bit of water 
to that area in, in the form of drip irrigation, and it's not being wasted, right? If we were doing sprinklers and stuff and trying to maintain green uh, grass, we would just be wasting water, okay? All right, so, so that dormant grass is fine. It's fine. All right, so uh, this picture was taken of our property in the back during the dormant season, okay? So I, I took it on purpose during that season, so it looks like everything is just like there's no growth there. It's because it's the dormant season. It's probably in March. You still see snow there. Um, now, one of the things that I always tell people is to observe, especially if you live in a snow belt, if it snows around where you live, to observe. Where does it melt first? Where does it, where, where is it spreading? Where does it melt last? Okay, um, that, that'll give you some clues. Not, it won't give you the whole story, but it gives you a part of the story. All right. Um, but what we have is we have a series of ponds that we put in because we have a seasonal creek that normally ran. You know, when we first moved there, it all flowed and ran for about four months, gone. Okay. So we put a series of ponds in there and a series of swales as tree growing systems that if they overflow, they overflow into that seasonal creek, which then goes into the ponds, overflows into the pond, overflows into the pond, okay? And we're adding a couple more, all right? So just, in my mind, you can't have enough water. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is. We, we just we have to have more water. We have to slow it down, okay? We have to slow it down, spread it, soak it, okay? So this is just an example of, of our property. Um, so I want to talk about this a little bit because I think what happens is people get in the wrong mindset, for lack of a way of better putting it. Okay, it's this whole idea of a scarcity versus an abundance mindset. Okay, everybody familiar with that? Kind of the difference between a scarcity and abundance mindset. You know, if it's all doom and gloom, then how we're going to probably you know match ourselves to that. Right, so what I tell people a lot is like, like they'll have some water storage. And I'll say, great, wonderful, you should have some water storage. Especially if you have animals and plants and all that kind of stuff. And then they're just like, that's a, but that's alone is a scarcity mindset. Okay? Having water storage, adding rainwater catchment systems, you know, depending on the, your site, okay? um, adding uh, ponds or, or just increasing soil infiltration, putting a lot of mulch down, that's an abundance mindset. Okay, that's that's where we can we can catch the rain basically like almost like I like to think of it as farming the rain, okay? utilizing it and, and, and utilizing it on your property as much as possible. Whether your property is a postage stamp or a very large you know, farm stamp. Okay? So we want to develop that abundance mindset. Simple is resilient. You guys heard this before? Simple is resilient. Okay, so we like here's an example outside of water. It's a hoop house. Okay, uh, you can see it in the layer. We don't we don't pull snow off of it in the layer, right? Um, and we actually house uh, layers in there in the winter for about 100 days, and they come out. And then guess what? The soils we do deep bedding method. The soils pretty warmed up and ready for planting pretty early. Okay, so that's one just the one text, but it's simple. It's very simple. All right, and down here is an example of just a simple gravity-fed water system. Okay, gravity-fed. So remember, we, we talked about you start at the highest point possible. Start at the highest point possible. Okay, and that might be for you. That might be five feet, and you can drain a little bit down. Yes. Did you finish off your water catchment things with clay, or perma or the? permeable bar that bar plastic barrier stuff. Um, as far as in our, our property? Yeah. Clay. Yeah. Okay. Clay. No, no, uh, no liners. Liner. No liners. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's not a perfectly sealed pond. We're actually working on that. And you can do that by doing things like with bentonite, which is a type of clay. Yeah. So we can add it in certain areas to try and seal it. So we're working on We have a couple kinks that we're working out. But gravity-fed water. So we have... Uh, I apologize, I don't have a picture, but we have a uh, one small area of our roof. That, well, we catch off we catch off everything pretty much, and I'm going to show you our rainwater catchment system. But we have a separate small rainwater catchment system that catches off just a piece, and it just happens to be that there's a downspout there, and we put a water trough there and set it up, and boom, there you go, water catchment, and then it has a, a, a hose bib on it with the hose bib, 
and then that slopes down just a little bit, kind of like this, to this hoop house, maybe six feet, five or six feet. You know, it's it's a, a the run is about seventy feet, okay, but a drop the drop is about six feet, not much, okay. You're not talking a lot of water pressure or anything like that. It's like uh, three less than three psi, but it's enough to go to get one of those uh, little hose bits on, and it's and it's enough to. Psh you know, work like that, and water tomatoes and peppers and things like that in the hoop house. We managed to walk, to keep our hoop house watered uh, all the way through July with just this little tiny rainwater catchment system. Okay, and that's not even our main rainwater catchment system. That's a really small sub part of it. And I, and I, I will show you the other part. Um, so that's why we want to start at the highest point possible. Okay, so if we can, so we can use that energy. It's stored energy, is what it is. Okay, simple is resilient. Turn waste streams into resources. Okay, I, I, I love this example. Um, and just as an aside, we use biological and natural fertilizers almost exclusively. Okay, almost exclusively. So rabbit manure teas, comfrey fertilizer teas, rabbit manure, you know, and compost. That's that's pretty much all we use. In fact, that's all we have to use, I believe, on our property. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have we put some water in here. The ducks play in it uh, for the week, okay, or whatever. It gets poopy and, and messy and dirty. And so, what most people will do is just dump it out and refill it, right? We take that, and take water cans, and go fertilizer for plants. And so, we utilize that. Okay. So, a waste stream. What normally is a waste stream turn into a resource and we can do that with water left and right left and right here's a very simple gray water catchment system and I'm going to show you we don't have a large-scale gray water catchment we do have a small system that I'll show you okay, another wonderful tool easy everyone should be able to do this in at least some way uh, and I'll give you uh, two examples okay this one is off of a, uh, just off the sink and it just is in an opportune area where that's easily plumbed where you can have it run out into a garden, okay? You can't do that everywhere. If you have a, you know, depending on your foundation, depending on plumbing, all this kind of stuff, it, it may be difficult, okay? But there are, I guarantee you, there are probably somewhere in your home or property or whatever where you can utilize gray water, okay? <coughs> uh, another very simple system is find, find a sink that's not used so much, maybe it's not the kitchen sink, okay, uh, but another area that's convenient, and that, you just disconnect the bottom and put a five gallon bucket underneath. If it's a place where you just wash your hands once in a while, it's a side sink or whatever that's not used very much, okay, and maybe, you know, it, it, would, be, it would be tough if it was something you had to, to dump out, you know, a couple times a day, but if it's something that you have to dump out every three days or every four days, that's pretty simple, okay? So you want to start small and simple. Okay, don't, don't worry about like revamping your whole property and going to get permits or everything else for, for a, a gray water system when you can just start with a bucket, okay? And I'll show you, I do, I'll show you an example of, of ours here in a minute. Function stacking, everybody heard of this? Okay, good principle, excellent principle. Everything we do, we think about this. How can we function stack? How can we, you know, and it, and it, you could be talking about a chicken, you could be talking about a structure, you could be talking about a whole garden area. How many different functions can, can we get? All right. So if I look at my food forest, we're getting medicine and uh, um, food, obviously, okay, um, and fuel. Okay, in some cases, we have, like, say, for example, we have black locust growing in our food forest. That that will be on a, a, a coppicing rotation. Okay, so that could be used for fuel, whether it's for a little rocket stove or, or what, or whatever. Okay, so function stacking. In this case, this is a, a wood cook stove that obviously is, can be used to cook food. It can be used to heat the home, the, the, the source, okay? Uh, it's used to dry herbs. So one, one of the things that we talked about in, um, that we will hit on just, just briefly is soil uh, texture and structure, okay? Texture and structure. Right? We can't really, it's hard, very difficult to, to change the texture, which is the, the sandstone clay, the amounts, but we can greatly impact the structure. 
and that increases soil infiltration greatly. So we can impact that greatly. Or the idea of simply mulching an area. I mean, you are retaining water greatly. Um, who, who here knows? If you use mulch, how much water do you save? Now, there, there's, this is, I know this is, a, there's varying answers out there, but let me tell, hear what you guys think. How much water do you think you save by mulching an area, as opposed to basically bare dirt? Bare times as much. What's that? I think the, it's a factor of 10. Okay. Anyone else? No idea. Okay. Some, some people, and again, it depends on where you read this. The, the least amount I've ever seen is that you save 25%. Wow. And I've seen lots of studies that show that you save 75% of whatever you're You can serve 75%. That is a massive amount, even if it's somewhere in the middle. Even if it's, even if it's only 25%, that's a huge, huge savings. Okay, so mulching, or like I like to do, living ground cover. Okay, now, will I chase down the tree service that's cutting underneath the, the power lines down the road for me? Absolutely, and I have. I have. And be, no, go turn that way and go dump it. I don't care, dump it in the driveway, you know. Uh, and we've done that. Okay, so I will definitely do that. Now, we, we don't even need to get into it as far as like what, you know, what is it a good use of technology to chip yourself versus get mulch another way. No, it doesn't matter. If you have access to mulch, use it. Okay, definitely use it. It's wonderful. You're going to save at least 25%, but probably much higher as far as water. Okay, now, so we talked about slowing and we've talked about soaking. What is this idea of spreading? Uh, what is that? What do you guys, what do you guys think? So we, we talked about a little bit as well. I mean, there's, you know, there's the drainage swale. Okay, which is slightly off contour, which is meant to move water from one place to another. Okay, there is the, the contour swale, which literally puts it on the dead level and, and is meant to spread it out, slow spread, and then you know, allow that water to soak in as much as possible. Okay, so there's two different techniques. I mean, people have been using irrigation channels and, for thousands of years. Okay, um, it's just a matter of, of smart use of it, I think. And this whole idea of, of, of tree crops where, I mean, in 1920, they're saying, like, talking about we need to be putting trees and planting trees on the horizontal. Amazing. Okay? And then he, he called them furrows. We know them as swales. Okay? Furrows on the horizontal as a tree planting system. Sound familiar? Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So he was talking about it in the 1920s. All right. So... Catch and store energy materials, water definitely falls into this. We want to slow spread and soak it as much as possible. There are many ways to do it. Okay, we talked about um, uh, irrigation channels. We talked about improving soil for its soil infiltration. What are some other ways that we can slow spread and soak water? We have to get creative. Okay? How else can we do it? Generally increase your surface area and like okay. barriers in the way. Okay. So, so the idea of slowing it down with a physical barrier. I love to use an I I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Let plants catch it. Let plants catch it. Living ground cover, maximize living ground cover. Okay, excellent. All right, um, I like to, I always, usually depending on the site, is I'll encourage clients to use check dams. Anybody here know what a check dam is? Okay, a check dam is, is a, a civil, civil engineering um, idea, not just using civil engineering, but if you drive by freeways, and look in the drainage ditches, and often you'll see like piles of rocks, piles of rocks. Uh -huh. Does this sound uh -huh. familiar to uh -huh. anybody? Okay, what is that doing? Making you stop? No, no, it's stop in the, the ditch. Road. It's in the ditch over there. So what is... Um, Keeping like big material stuff from clogging up further down. Okay, excellent. So it, soil erosion. They're trying to stop soil erosion. Okay, um, so, and they're also doing one more thing that's very important. So soil erosion is definitely one of them. That's, in fact, that's their pretty much their only purpose for doing it. Uh, what else? What's that? Slowing water down. Slowing water down. Slowing, it. Slowing water down. Okay. It, it stops soil erosion and it slows water. So again, now you're gonna you're gonna look out and you're gonna see like ah, that's what they're doing. Think you know like every couple hundred feet or whatever they they might and then 
if they have a certain area where a lot of water goes, sometimes they're what you would usually find there. Do you guys big like gold? massive yeah. amounts of rock? Okay, big gabion or even bigger rock. Okay, to stop soil erosion and slow water. All right, we can do the same thing on our properties. You have a seasonal stream. We have check dams in our seasonal stream, along with ponds, along with swales that lead into those those areas. Okay, so simple, simple ways of slowing water down. Yes? So do you have a, a backhoe or do you rent a backhoe and then learn how to do that? I don't have one. Um, I, I usually rent an excavator once a year and try and get everything done in three days. <laughs> okay, that's what I try and do. Okay. So um, dig ponds, uh, dig swales, clear if I need to clear. So we have another, I didn't tell you about this because I don't have much time. We have an uh, agroforestry experimental area a two acre area. So we thinned that very heavily. Okay, and we planted a bunch of black walnut in there. We're trying to kind of recreate not the not the oak savanna but the uh, a forest farming type thing. Yeah. Okay. So but that's that's like a zone four if in permaculture we would call that like a zone four area. It's hands off. I mean I planted and it's like fire and forget. Yes, deer are gonna go in there and they're gonna some of, some of those black ones are not going to make it, for sure. Okay. Um, so that's how I deal with it. I, I, we don't have any big equipment, but we'll, about once a year we'll rent one and get it all done. Because <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, the bottom line is that these earthworks that, that I'm doing are, are going to be um, helping that land for hopefully hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Before I talk about this, one more, one more way to slow spread and soak water. You guys got to come up with one more way. So we talk about check dams, we talk about soil infiltration, we talk about um, uh, kind of swale, the idea of the drainage swale. What else? You do you like marshlands? Okay, so um, uh, like a wetland. Mm -hmm. Okay, so slowing it and creating a wetland, or or what do you mean? I guess yeah, you would have to. You could. I mean, no, you could. I mean, that's in fact, uh, um, I'm working with a couple other designers on a, uh, in Bonners Ferry, you know, Bonners Ferry, I know. Okay, there's a hospital there, and uh, we're working on a project there, and one of the things we're doing is basically building a wetland. Okay, because there's a lot of water that flows, in fact, over 100,000 gallons of water. We did the calculations. It flows through this area, this one little area, and just gone. So what we're doing is to slow it, and be able to spread and soak it is that we're creating a wetland to filter it because the water is all coming from roofs and pavement, okay, from the parking lot. So we're, we're running it all through, and then we're going to run it through a wetland to filter it, and that is also slowing it and going to be able then to hopefully spread that out into uh, an edible forest garden. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. Yes. Along the same lines, on a much smaller scale, gray water um, being integrated into as a source for like small ponds in marshland. Absolutely, yeah. So, so um, instead of gray water or black, not black water, but gray water running through the septic lines into the septic, into the septic field, for example, or in back into the community um, uh, sewage treatment plants, it's being slowed, spread and soaked and used in other ways. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to get at is we got to think outside the box. It's not just Rain, it's rainwater catchment. Okay, put it in a barrel. Put it in a barrel off a downspout, and is that not slowing water? I mean, that water was just going to run off anyway, right? So we slowed it, and now are we going to spread it? Sure, we're going to spread it. Just we're going to spread it, our, you know, wherever we want. Maybe it's into a rain garden, or maybe that's used to water specific areas of plants. Maybe that's that barrel's being used to water a couple of cold frames sitting right next to it. Maybe that rainwater is being used to, to water animals. I mean, you know, whatever. So um, we can think of this idea of slow spread and soak in many different ways. Many different ways. Okay. Small scale intensive systems. Um, here's an example. So this is our property. Uh, another really good, really good principle. Okay. Small scale and intensive. You don't have to start by 
you know, it would be nice if we could all, if we all had, you know, five or ten acres and we could all do the earthworks first and put in ponds and, and swales and all this other stuff or key line design and then, you know, put in our plantings. We can't, we can't always do that, right? We can't always do that. But you can start small and you can start at your doorstep or right out your back door or whatever. Okay, so here's an example of a system, small scale and intensive. Now this was an experiment and I'll tell you the results. All right, so what we have here, let me tell you the experiment first. What we have is basically just the water line coming in and then we built a compost pile. Relatively small compost pile to do a small scale experiment. We ran a line through the compost and then um, out the hooks out there. Okay, so we built the compost pile, lined it through there, and uh, monitored the compost pile. Within two days, it was cooking at about 155 degrees. Okay, we push in water that's 55 degrees, and it's coming out at about 110 degrees. Okay, we use that for a seasonal shower. Blows away the the solar shower. Solar shower is great, but if they're you know if it's not you know I don't know about you, but I don't like to take lukewarm or cold showers. That was given us a hot shower. Now that worked for, uh, in, this, in this case, between 30 and 45 days. Okay? Built a compost pile, between 30 and 45 days hot water. Okay? Not large amounts, because again, it was a small scale experiment. It's, you know, you're basically making a couple, two and a half, in fact, we fill those little two and a half gallon containers, put it up there, and you got a nice shower. Yes, nice hot shower. Sometimes you had to put in a cool water before you could take the shower. Yes. So you, that, that was actually my question. It was you, you would be filling up those buckets, but how would you be needing, you know, it's obviously taking the water that's in the hose to keep up, I'm imagining, or was the, the, the storage container in the compost pile? Uh, good question. No, storage container is not in the compost pile. Okay. So we would literally just take the hose and fill up the containers from the compost pile. And we can moderate the temperature, so like I said it was about 110 degrees, mm -hmm. uh, by you know, the first bit of water that would come out would be cool. Mm -hmm. And we just got to, kind of got to know it. Uh -huh. and, and know and about how much hot water you really get before you need to turn it off again and then let it warm up and then refill it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah, it ended up being almost exactly the size of that. It's yeah. like fill it up and it was the water was perfect. It just kind of worked out that way. We took, yeah, I mean, it was just it just kind of worked out that way. This is two and a half gallons, and that was perfect for a, a, a shower, about a five minute shower. Of course, it's low flow, you know, but it still is very adequate, very, very, very good. I enjoy it. That's why, you know, my summer showers are outdoors off of a compost pile. Yeah, and we so. figured it out because the first time we were using five gallon containers and then realized, like, oh, we have to really stop it early because now it's getting cold and he doesn't like cold showers. <laughs> so he was like, ah, I think two and a half gallons would be perfect. And so he got that so that he could fill it up and not have to worry about measuring or figuring out where everything was. Mm -hmm. It came out right every time. So. Yeah. I'm noticing you've got that nice shed roof there. Have you done anything with the your hose kind of wrapping on that? I, just, I feel like I've seen that um, design as well. Yeah, yeah, no, you you could, and here's here's a couple of uh, modifications you could do. No, number one is make the pile a whole lot bigger, way bigger. Okay, there's a guy named Jean Pond, who's a French inventor that was doing this large scale in the 1970s. He was making massive, you know, like 10, 20 ton piles, where he was getting, you know, hundreds of gallons of hot water for 18 months, and generating power from that same. The heat from that pile. And, and okay. methane, probably. Yes, he was. He was powering buildings and, and providing all the hot water for buildings. This is like large scale experimentation. Well, not even. I mean, he was, he was effective. 18 months. I mean, that's pretty amazing when you think about like uh, you know, how much energy it requires to heat water. Yeah, I, I would recommend to everybody if you go to YouTube, Gene Payne, G E A N, Payne, P A I N, on. Part one and part two. There's two parts, yeah. and it shows them making the piles. It's an invaluable resource to actually see the piles. And it's at least one of the leaders in the world of this time. Yes, absolutely. And so our this was a, a small scale experiment based on his work. Just like man, this guy's incredible. We're going to do this on a small scale and see if we can take hot showers in the summer without using any energy. 
and do it. Okay? So now, the next experiment for us is about three times that size. Nothing like gene pond as far as the point time and all that, but, but something on the order of maybe three times that size. I would love to be able to go to produce is hot water, say four months. Yeah. Say four months or so at a, at a, at a clip. Okay, that'd be awesome. Okay, so in this case, yes, we're so we're using water, 55 degrees in, 110 degrees out, hot shower. Okay, we have a line down here, small little tiny gray water system. Gray water system comes out out of this building, goes out here, and it goes into this mini swale that's right here. Flows into there, spreads out, soaks in. What's right below it in a slot is just a very slight slope, and our outdoor nursery where we graft fruit trees and do things like that. So we have a number of fruit trees, uh, currants, elderberry that we're propagating right there. Okay, so that's <coughs> hot compost, hot water, compost used on gardens, gray water, filling swell, slow spread and soak, and, and um, that water lens that is aiding in watering an outdoor nursery, producing fruit trees currents and elevators. Yes? Just from, I'm trying to get a visual idea of where you are, where is your nursery in relation to this? Where? So it's kind of hard to see, it's in here. Uh -huh. so you yeah, probably have you know, maybe 15 trees and shrubs in there. Uh, can't see it, it's a big big giant so mess. They're, they're, <laughs> on, they're on, in the swale. They're yeah, the swale. well, no, there's a small swale here. Or on the berm, rather. Well, there are some on the berm, but they're also just in and, and that, that land slightly, slightly slopes, slopes down that way. Yeah. So it's hitting a swell, but then it, the water kind of goes down um, into the soil that direction. Yeah, and you can't see it because, you know, the trees are this big. Yeah. I, I, just, I grafted on uh, scion to rootstock and put them in here, and they're going to stay there for another year, and then they'll get moved. Okay. So that's a, an example of a small-scale intensive system, but, but good use of water, real good use of water. So the water is is being heated by compost and making compost. I mean, think about all the functions that we can talk about just in this little tiny system. They have all the different functions. We're creating compost, we're creating hot water, we're able to, to uh, enjoy a hot shower, and, and that gray water is then being used to fertilize and, or water plants. Where's your cold water coming from? Just a well or a yes. spring? Yes, it's a well. In this case, okay. it's a well, but we could, we could run um, rainwater through it. You know, we could do all kinds of modifications, but for this experiment, it's well pumping water through. You can use little jet pumps. You can do um, all kinds of like those little, real small solar jet pumps that can come off rainwater catchment. There's all kinds of things that you can do to modify this. But we wanted to prove out this system first, and then we'll modify from there. Yes. So um, I'm curious if you have. I know you said your trees are small, but. Um, has like buildup from soap and shampoos and things. Is that um, some trees responded much better to kind of that additional like yeah. nitrogen boost, or are some trees more like mm, no thanks? I'm mean, just interested. Yeah, no, that's no, a great question. Um, that's one reason why we put in the swale there, mm -hmm. kind of a, as a filter. The okay. Earth is the filter for it, and so we haven't noticed any impact. <clears throat> and, and we use kind of more natural stuff anyway. In, in part, I, I was asking because when I lived in Peru, built, did a bunch of earthworks with um, rainwater gardens with big banana circles. Because um, bananas are super okay with lots of really not yeah. Dr. Bronner's esque <laughs> detergents and soaps and things. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's true when you when you start talking about uh, rain gardens or, or <coughs> you are concentrating um, nutrient. Okay, you you really are. Bottom swales and that's why again it's a genius simple system is that the basically the earth filters it for you and so why I did a wetland filtering um, water that has high, high nutrient or or toxins in it filters it out and then that's used so same thing when it, when it goes into a swell water goes into a swell slow spreads and soaks goes under the ground it's getting filtered okay um, but at the same time we don't you know we try and use pretty neutral but I'm stuck. Okay. Uh, we're, we're big into uh, that whole the whole um, concept principle of getting a yield. Okay, we, we believe that you should as a permaculturist get a yield. Okay, you should get a yield. Both short term and long term. Short term and long term. Okay? 
But it's the same thing with water. We can apply that same idea to water. It's like, okay, can you tomorrow leave this, leave here, and go home and you know dig swales and ponds? No. But you could go if you've got a balance valve. You could go throw a barrel underneath it. If you have a, 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 a particular basin, you could throw a bucket underneath it and have a great water system tomorrow. You could have a rainwater catchment system tomorrow. Now, might you know you might want to improve that. We'll talk about good rainwater catchment systems. But you could have some, some of that stuff tomorrow. Okay. So again, same thinking. Short term, short term might be simple gray water systems. It might be simple rainwater catchment systems. Long term, looking at design of the property, looking at maybe you know if it's appropriate check dams, which are again are also simple. <coughs> Ponds, swales, or key line design. You know the site will determine what's appropriate. Okay, so it's not you know it's not always swales. Okay, that, in fact, there's a big controversy in the permaculture right now, unfortunately, over swales versus key line design. Okay, so, so for us, a short-term idea would be, um, say, rainwater catchment. A long-term idea is building ponds and, in, and, and improving habitat, building riparian areas, if you have seasonal streams or streams, improving riparian areas for filtration, for forage, for animals, all, all I mean, we could talk all day about all the functions that you can stack with this idea. Okay, so let's talk rainwater. This is one of our systems. Say it's pretty simple. Um, we catch and as a, uh, does anybody do rainwater catchment? No? Okay. A little bit, all right. So, you know, maybe you can start, right? Be a simple way to kind of jump into water resiliency. Um, Okay, here in Montana and North Idaho, it's seasonal, of course, right? So we have to take into some of those considerations with, with freezing and, and gutters and, and, and all that. So okay. you, you turn this off every year pretty much? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and in November-ish, uh, early November, uh, we'll turn up. I mean, we'll, we'll still, usually we'll still have water in there, so we'll, we'll utilize it. We'll, you know, we'll drain it, we'll drain the tank, we shut the system off for the winter. Okay. So first of all, seasonal. Yes. I find that if you drain about one third of the tank volume, it'll expand pretty far, but not all the way. And another trick is to drain the center out because the perimeter always freezes first. So if you keep the drain free from freezing and you drain that center out as it freezes in, get down around 40 below, you drain that center out and that will be the expansion point and then it won't break. What do you mean? I mean, how, how do you drain the center? How do you drain the center? Yeah, yeah, as it freezes. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. So you're waiting for it to slowly start. Yeah, freezing. you gotta, you gotta get brave enough to do that. Yeah, well, <laughs> it takes years and years of experience. Yeah, because you'll break a tank. I've already yes. had. But generally, almost all my tanks, I run around seven thousand gallons. You can go ahead and you can drain basically one third of them, and uh, they'll really expand but not break. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. That's really good, yeah, because. I, I don't want to break tanks, so I usually just drain them. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I'm good. dependent on water year-round to water okay. everything, so okay. I, can't, I can't go without the water. Are you from Montana? Yeah, yeah. Because the ice Southwest. is here. Southwest, okay. And then, All right. Does anybody well, do cool. underground, cool. Tanks? underground yes. tanks? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. And then those don't freeze, do they? Correct. You can, yeah, you can look. I mean, this is a, <coughs> this is a much uh, more... What's that? Inexpensive way to, to do it, and starting in underground concrete tanks and things. Very, very good. You can run those. Um, well, even that is tough to run year round, but you can certainly store water year round. So, yes, you can absolutely do that. Underground, in fact, we work with clients who are designed to underground systems. For sure. Yes, for us, it's kind of cost prohibitive. So, we stick with the above ground. We have, Again, we've built in a lot of water resilience. Okay, a lot. So we have annual streams and seasonal streams and, and ponds and um, check dams, swales. We've increased soil infiltration greatly. We do water storage beyond just rainwater catchment because we have a lot of animals. So you know we need to keep a good amount of water on hand. We have a hand pump on our well. You know so. Uh, but but yeah. So uh, but we've worked, I've worked with clients. We've done underground cisterns, and that's a, a wonderful, awesome way to do. It's just a little bit more intensive of a system, requires a little bit of pumping, 
Um, well, and that, you could put a, you could still get water, but. Um, so that's that's kind of what we do. It's very simple. We um, basically from the point of, of uh, gutters, or in most cases, seeing something a little different here. We go PVC below because it's just really easy to work with, and the elbows all work and and drain straight into our system. We've got this is what we call a first flush system. So it's just a certain amount of water that all the initial water runs and drains into first. That fills up, and then the water flows. And then down here we have kind of a weeping plug, so over the next, after it stops raining, maybe 12 hours, it'll drip out slowly. Okay, so, so, so the water that's all in here slowly drains out after it stops raining. Okay. Is that to wash away all the contaminants out of the water first? Yeah, the contaminants and maybe any little extra right. stuff that gets in there, and then we clean that out um, periodically. Okay, now we do have filters um, in a couple different places. We have one here. We have another one here. Okay, so we do kind of a triple flush system, just basic. But though, even though um, primary use for this is animals, secondary is plants, first year is emergency water for us. Okay. Any questions on that? Why is it black? Um, it slows, doesn't stop the uh, like algae growth. Okay. Um, you know, different different yeah. ideas on that, but for us. We found that um, painting it black stops the vast majority of the algae growth and everything else. Yeah. Poly tanks, the clearer ones, <clears throat> aren't uh, pH stable. So if pH is a great issue for horticultural purposes, you've got to cover the tank. Yeah. That's a good point. So pH, what? Did stable. you say that again? You have to color the tank. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm not good at this. Uh, but yeah, uh, clear poly tanks are not pH stable. Sunlight uh, mm -hmm. changes your pH, and if pH is critical to what you're growing, if you're in a limestone area, pH is critical. Yeah. So without yeah. sun, it would be fine. Yes, if you can keep the tank dark. Yeah, oh. that's that's why we either either yeah you know, black is a good idea. Black or, and we also kind of have it as much as possible sheltered from a lot of direct sun. Uh, oh, okay. That's you know, so a couple different techniques you can use for that, and then of course underground would, would be or vegetation, other. or vegetation, absolutely. Okay, and um, I should have I should have uh, showed I should have showed a picture. I've got a, our hops have grown like 30 feet this year, and I just like so yeah, you can grow hops or grapes over this and totally shade it up. No problem. Uh, okay, so. You know, cold issues with above ground tanks, uh, for smaller ones that's an issue, so for us, we just drain them, okay? Um, there's some other other techniques out there that we haven't experimented with yet. Um, we we have gutters, and we haven't had any problems. We don't, the snow doesn't rip off our gutters or anything else, but we also do have asphalt shingles as opposed to metal roof. And what I always recommend to clients is if, you, if they have metal roof, they want to do rainwater catchment, is use you know, your guards, your snow guards that slows the snow. Okay, that's, so that's another way of slowing water because then as it melts, it's actually used instead of sloughing off all at once. Okay. Um, and there's some other things that you could do. Uh, so, in fact, here's, here's an example. I forgot I put this in here. Of a, in this case, it's an underground <coughs> system for some work I did with somebody else. So in this case, they're doing, they have metal roofing, they've got the snow break up there, they've got their, their first flush system, their catchment. Um, does anybody know the rules of thumb on rainwater catchment? Like how much you can catch uh, under certain, are, are you catching off, you're talking thousand about square, Thousand square feet on the size of what I had is about 250 gallons. I mean a quarter of an inch is about 200. It's, yes. I'm but, getting it wrong, quarter of an inch. A rain on a thousand square feet um, is 250 gallons. Quarter okay. of an inch. Okay, yeah. Roughly, roughly. Roughly. Yeah. So the rule of thumb I like to use is is for 2,000 square feet of catchment, for every one inch of rain is 1,250 gallons. Okay, roughly. So if you have that, 1,000 gallons, an inch of rain is 625, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and so then you can, and that's close to what, yeah, what you said. Um, How many gallons did you say? Yeah. 1,250 gallons. Now, um, and when you do calculations and you're sizing tanks and when, when, um, that kind of thing, you always account for about 10% loss. 
So if you would just want to say 2,000 square feet, one inch of rain, 1,000 gallons, you'd be okay. You'd be really okay to do that. Okay, and then the other thing you need to look at is like, how much does it rain in your area? And at what intervals? Okay, this is really important. As people say, like, well, we get you know, 20 inches of rain, and that's, you know, I'm going to get 17,000 gallons, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, but you have a, a rain barrel, you know, you have a 55 gallon drum, <laughs> you're going to be spilling over, uh, you know, so much. Okay, so you have you know, to properly size your tanks, and which, what a good rule of thumb to do is um, look at a couple things. Number one, the, the extreme event, the 100 year event. Okay, so you can look at those numbers and go, okay, yes, I'm not going to design my rain storage for the 100-year event, but I need to know what it is, right? And then also frequency. So frequency, if you're getting quarter inch of rain, oh, yep, sorry, quarter inch of rain, like every day for a week, that's a lot of rain, you're gonna overflow your tanks, okay? Unless you, you put in a big tank, okay? But, but where I am, in, in North Idaho, we do get 28 inches of rain annually, but the, the average rain is 0.1, Okay, the average rain is about 0.1 at a time. Okay, that's not very much. And we, we do have a rainy season, and we get the very occasional 0.25, but it's very rare for us to go above that. Okay, so I can get away with a 550 gallon tank, although I, I really, the proper size for ours is 1,000 gallons, if you want to get technical and, and be, but that's what I've got, so I'm using that. So 550 gallons, okay? We get like about nine to eleven inches around there, so it's like yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I have so many gallons. I mean, I go run about five to seven thousand gallons, and I even run out. How Especially about, in the spring, you, you know, when if you're growing fruit trees and stuff like that in the spring when you're setting fruit and stuff, yep. you don't. If you don't have spring rains, you're really in trouble if you don't have the available water. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so that's why you know, for us, the majority of you know, if you were to look at, and when I, again, this is important to look at in your area, look at the, you know, the spread on months and how much rain on average, usually a 30 year average, gives you a good ballpark. Um, and, and so that helps you to design the system. Okay. And so when I work with people, uh, I look at all of that. And, then, and that helps to design, of course, based on the goals and objectives of what people are trying to do. Right. So, so whether it's water catchment, for animals or, or, or uh, plants or just, you know, reducing pressure. I mean, we haven't even talked about this, but how much all of this reduces pressure off of the septic, yeah. reduces pressure off of the commercial system, maybe, depending on you know, where you're at and all that. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. You guys have that. Good questions. All right. So... Another Russell Smith quote. I just love this book, Tree Crops. You gotta read it. I'm telling you. Forest, field, plow, desert. That is the cycle of the hills under most plow agriculture. Cool. Ben Rob? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He wrote this in the 1920s, right? I mean, this is amazing to me. But he saw what would happen. <laughs> um, tree crops. Yes, excellent book. Um, the average rate of soil erosion on U.S. cropland is seven tons per acre per year. That seems just outlandish, doesn't it? Okay, and again, I'm talking about commercial land, but if if you watch, if you watch big equipment, especially you know when they're plowing, you can just see like, wow, there goes the field. Yeah. Behind them. All right. So, you know, th this is. How long does it take to build one inch of topsoil? What do you guys think? Thousands of years. Depends so on if, if it gets help or not. Yeah. 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 Rain. Really? Sure. Rain. Yes. Yeah. Outside of help, what's called. Right. Say a hundred years. Okay. So of course it's dependent on the site, but yeah, they're, they're, I've seen everything from the, you know the, the best site might might only be a hundred years. Okay. The really really bad sites might be a thousand. Okay, for an inch of topsoil. Yes, we can absolutely move that along and help that. We can call it basically uh, speeding up succession. Okay? Um, so I'll give you an example. All right? So I told you I, I, I like gardeners, right? I, I don't. You know, I, they're very, very pretty, very manicured 
blondes and girls and love that. Okay, that's not our style and it's not what I want them to, to move to eventually, but I appreciate those things. In fact, we're part of lots of different gardening clubs. We're master gardeners with the uh, University of Idaho, and so we work in, we volunteer in the plant clinic. And so we see a lot of people come in and go, there's a bug eating my plant, and I, what do I spray? To, to, to go. Uh, so we're like, you know, well, you know, how about this over here? You know, maybe try this and that before we do that. Okay, so uh, working in the plant clinic, the city of Coeur d'Alene, who here has been in Coeur d'Alene? Okay, the city of Coeur comes in and says, hey, we have 60 tons of leaf litter every year that uh, I just needed, we need to take to the landfill. What can we do with such a thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, cool. this is mind-boggling to me. It's like, no, it's a resource, right? A waste stream turned into a resource. Leaf litter is a, is a resource. It's a good way of remineralizing soil. Okay, so a lot of people, maybe some of you know, if you want to remineralize soil, what is the conventional wisdom on how to do this? I quiz you guys. What do you guys think? Ground minerals, ground rocks. Yes, absolutely. That's the, you know, the number one answer. Okay, we got to build, bring in rock dust, and we got to you know, gypsum and all this other stuff. Okay, and so we, we you know, buy 50 pound bags of rock dust and we spread it on as an amendment. Okay, leaf litter can actually do the same thing. No. Yes, absolutely. Leaf litter can do the same thing. Okay, so give up on the rock dust and start saving the leaf litter and start grabbing your neighbors, especially if they don't spray for trees. It's like, boom, I'll take that, I'll take that. Yeah. Okay, okay and, if, and if you want to speed that along, use a little bit of energy to, to shred it, okay, a little lawnmower over the top of leaf, and then put it in soil. It'll, not only is, it'll work as a mulch, it'll help remineralize soil. Okay, it'll help retain water. Okay? Yeah, they shed their leaves because of the, the mineral buildup. So it's part of the recycling of the tree. It's nutrient recycling. Yes, Absolutely. exactly. It's, it's nutrient recycling, and, and that's what it is designed. That's why you don't need to weed water or fertilize forests because of nutrient recycling. You don't need to do it there because we allow that process to happen. Yes. So if um, you had, like I do, a field that's time. been overgrazed in yes. areas not for my animals, but for a long time, that's what it was. If I were to put this leaf litter on the area with the uh, uh, napweed, it would redo it, right? Is that what you're saying? It would re, because um, it seems like the soil where the napweed is is sterile. There's nothing else but napweed growing just in these yeah. isolated dry areas. Yeah, no, no, that's excellent. So napweed is an, is an indicator plant <laughs> yeah. for low fertility. Yes. Okay, just like a, a tansy or, or mullein or uh, out here, greasewood. <laughs> oh, so it's like tansy or mullein? No, well, I, I'm just saying is uh, when we look at plants, we can say that that is an indicator. If I have lots of, if I have lots of dandelion in my my turf, my grass, which I don't, we don't have grass. Mm -hmm. but we don't have turf. I love the dandelions. I love them too. Yeah. That's but if you see that, so everybody comes in the plant and it's like, how do I get rid of the dandelions? No. Like, you know, how do, how do I get rid of dandelions and clover? <laughs> I don't want that nitrogen fixer and that deep-rooted dandelion to break up my soil and I want it to stay okay. compacted and really bad. <laughs> no, um, I don't. No, so I don't it's an indicator plant okay. and so napweed is also, we have napweed on our property too. Okay, so I've tried a, the sheep thing, they're not going to eat it. They, yeah, they, it's tough. Sheep will. and goats, they will, ours, they will take care of tansy, they'll take care of hawkweed, they'll take care of, um, what else they take care of? Uh, other other invasive oxide, oxide daisy, our goats dig oxide daisy, um, but yeah, napweed is tougher. Yeah, no doubt about it. So what I would recommend to you is what I would recommend is is that keep you know if you're doing rotational grazing and you're not overgrazing areas that you're doing, yeah, yeah. okay, keep doing that and over time it's going to improve. Um, but if you have pasture, if there's grasses and, and things in there, you know, uh, rotational grazing is about the, the best thing you can do. You know, and that will eventually also remineralize soil. So you're not going to hurt anything by spreading the leaf litter. And the, but the number one thing you can do is understand that the plants are indicating something. And number two, keep going with the rotational grazing. Manage rotational grazing. It's the best way to rejuvenate land. Get some 
I like civil, I love civil pastor. Um, if, if you're not familiar with Silver Pastor, you gotta look it up. It's what, what, it's what Russell Smith, Silva Pastor. Silvo Pastor. Silvo Pastor. It's what Russell Smith called two-story agriculture. Uh -huh. Okay, and what we, a fancy term nowadays, <laughs> you can go get college degrees uh, in agroforestry and about Silvo Pastor. Okay. Oh, well, excellent. That's, that would, that's a, uh, an area very, very much of interest to me. We do civil pasture, we do forest farming, which are subsections of what's called agroforestry, <coughs> which is really closely, it's not, it's not permaculture, but it's like permaculture. Some of the same principles would apply to both. You know, the, the commercial industry and, and universities and stuff are getting a hold of agroforestry, which is a good thing. Okay, it's in a very much an improvement, but they're trying to spin and put the, okay, well we have to, you know, Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's not all bad at all, and it's a, it's a really good way forward. Okay, it's the idea of two-story agriculture, and I got to keep moving. Soil infiltration. We have talked about this. So, um, you know, I had put here you can be increased up to seventy-five percent. Okay, uh, you can increase soil infiltration up to seventy-five percent. Of course, that's just a general number thrown out, but we can all improve whatever we have as far as soil infiltration. You want to reduce compaction. Okay, that's another excellent just idea. Okay, so when you look at your turf and you see dandelions in it, go good. Dandelions are in, they're reducing compaction by their deep rooted system. If you ever pull up turf and look where dandelions were, it's just no, I mean, you know, the, the root systems off of your, you know, Kentucky bluegrass and fescues and things are this deep, and then the dandelion roots are, are down. Okay, so they're they're trying to like repair yeah. so, soil. Okay, increase organic matter. You can always, always, always do this, and so that's the whole idea of uh, you know like taking a waste stream, 60 tons in just one city a year, and utilizing that as a resource. Uh, keep cover, so mulching, uh, maximizing ground cover, any way that you can keep ground cover. Bare dirt is not good. Okay, bare soil is not good. Yes? So, kind of a side note, if you end up wanting to tear up some, some turf, like some Kentucky bluegrass or something, can you then use that as a, as like a organic matter, like compost or something, or will that try and recall this? No, I like it. We, we've done, um, we've built hooviculture beds, and we take the turf, turn it upside down, and put it on there, and then put stuff on top of that. Okay. Um, and we'll yeah. try and regrow. I mean, it's, it's always a possibility that some of it's going to punch back through. Okay. But if course. you have enough uh, already growing on top, it really yeah. out competes it anyway. Yeah. Okay. It'll kind of kill the grass off. Okay, so the idea of a, um, wow, is it already? Okay, so I, I've got to finish here in a couple minutes. <laughs> um, the idea of a rain garden is an excellent way to slow spread and soak water. We talked about this briefly. It's just a wonderful way. And, and so if you have an area that drains off of your roof that's really wet during those rainy periods, research and look into establishing a rain garden, okay, and get a yield. This is um, wonderful, it's beautiful, but they're probably just, you know, using it to filter water and just look nice. Can't get a yield out of it. So you can plant medicinals and different things that you can still utilize even though it's quote unquote dirty water. Okay? Um, so there's there's still ways to do that. We don't have time to go into all of those. Water wise gardening, mulch, gray water usage, now plants I I've not found to be a problem, especially if you run it through any kind of a filter, whether it's a reed system or a soil system or anything like that. Gardens on contour, that used to be normal. Uh, we've had more designed for the site. You know, drip irrigation, it, you know, you use a whole lot less water if you're doing drip irrigation as opposed to overhead. You also have a whole lot less fungal issues. Okay? Gardening on contour, farming. Farms used to be, uh, be normal to farm on contour. Okay, and that's the whole idea of uh, a two-story agricultural as well. We don't do that now. We used to go fence row to fence row, straight lines, big machines. Okay? Um, Building skills in, in, in the area of, you know, this is just an example of in general, but if you look at uh, um, water, whether it's filtration, rainwater catchment, 
there's a whole lot to gray water use. You know, this is building skills. Um, and that will help your resiliency greatly. Okay? That's us. We are done now. Do you have any questions? Oh, well, she wanted to spring. Talk about spring. Oh, I, yeah, real quick. So, spring development. So, a spring is uh, water that's basically being pushed out, out of the ground, and that's a good thing. And if you if you increase soil infiltration across your property, you you increase and do these kind of water techniques. And a lot of cases, people find the springs will, will, will appear. Okay. And so utilizing a spring is a whole art in itself as far as development. There's sim very simple ways to do it, and there's, there's <coughs> intensive, uh, very um, uh, difficult you know, ways to do it. So for us, it is as simple as um, developing a small catchment basin, uh, uh, protecting the area with things like uh, gravel and things that basically keep animals from pooping right in that area, uh, and then allowing the water that's naturally coming up to focus into a certain area, and then you've got a source of water, and it might be seasonal, it might be year-round, it might be very low uh, producing, or it could be very extensive. You know, either way. Uh, but then, then taking that idea and then trying to gravity feed, if possible. If not, there's all kinds of wonderful um, solar slow pumps that, that can move water a lot, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, pretty well. Okay, so we don't have enough time to go into spring development, but if you've got a spring, that's that's just an awesome thing to look at, even if it's seasonal. It's worth developing if you can do it yourself. Okay? It doesn't cost that much money to develop. It's very, you know, we I did it with a shovel and some some parts and I don't know, less than a hundred bucks. Okay, yes. Aside from Russell Smith's literature, do you have any other good foundational texts that you learned a lot from? Well, I mean, in, the, in permaculture in general, I mean, I've got my, my foundational books, the uh, Elbow Forest Gardens, the two volume set, Gaia's Garden, uh, Resilient Farm and Homestead, the Permaculture Manual, Designer's Manual, those were kind of my key texts as far as <coughs> permaculture is concerned, and there's obviously lots of water in there as well. Uh, tree crops is great. Um, there's um, Brad Lancaster, Dry land. Water you, harvesting for the dry land. Yes, yeah. that's an excellent resource as well. Water else. harvesting for a dry land. For the dry land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that in Tucson. Yeah. yeah, and so, I mean, look, we used to live in Yuma, Arizona, where there was four inches of rain annually a year. Okay. Uh, hats off to everyone down there. We get four inches of rain. But, but you know what's so, over? If you look at even, you don't have to go that far. Let's look at Yakima. All right. Yakima Valley, average annual rainfall eight inches. Okay, it's cheap energy is the only thing keeping that place moving. All right, cheap energy. That's it. You pump yeah. out of the river. That's, that's it's the irrigation channels. Everybody utilizes it. That's the only way. That works. Yeah. Any any further questions? Okay, so we're at Prepared Homestead. You can get us on online our website preparedhomestead.org. I've got some some uh, business cards if you want those. Um, we've got a Facebook page. We, we have, we opened up a homestead and breakfast. It's a, it's a bed and breakfast. It's a permaculture demonstration site. So you have guests coming from all over. Half of them don't even know what we are, what we're doing. And then they get a chance to see it and they're really like, this is cool. We're gonna look into some more. So we're on different sites over there. And like I said, I'll put some cards here, some business cards. Our contact information is on there. And thank you for yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah.